So I'm going to do this like really, really fast uh, introduction. Uh, so I don't know if you know the Phantom, but at the beginning uh, in, the, in some comics, he has like this uh, for those who came late, and um, uh, like really short introduction of what happened in the story. So I'm going to do that to put you like in context for the new ones. Um, and after that, I'm going to continue with the, with the exposition from yesterday, like the second part. So, as I told, uh, thank you for to the attendees and to the, on, and, and to the organizers for, for being here. And also, sorry for my English. As I told you, this is the only one I have. We can work with the Spanish, if you want, or with the Spanglish. Uh, and we can do some uh, Q&A to make myself uh, like clearer. Um, as, as I told you yesterday, I think that I over-deliver on my promise. I told you that I, will, I, am, uh, I, I gave an strange talk, uh, and I did that, uh, I did that. Um, and it was strange because of the messiness of the talk, if you want, uh, particularly in a technical uh, audience. And this messiness was not like, not like this messy, uh, not like this one, because it was not related with some kind of, uh, I don't know, virtuoso, elegant, a uh, crack, a capo, a uh, duro, depending on what are you talking about. It was more related with this kind of messiness. Um, but I think that that's important, kind of, because, yeah, it can be like confusing. Uh, you can ask me what is the point or what's the, what, what's the particular uh, practice or uh, the body practice of, or, of all these concepts. Um, but I think that that's important because in these kind of events, you have like a lot of let's say parallel lines, like, like the people is close, the people is like sharing these kind of technical traditions, technical backgrounds, these ways of exposing, exposing uh, yeah, these common topics. And I think that that's important also. But uh, I think that we need to, to, yeah, to deliver some, some messiness. And in that kind of messiness, uh, we talk about like the resonances between a small talk and grassroots innovation, for example, between a small tool and design-based research, like using this idea of prototyping as a way of understanding, what is called the design way of, of knowledge, uh, uh, about civic tech, about technopolitics, about meta-tools, tools that are used to describe other tools or, or the gap between them, and between autopoietic and heteropoietic systems. So I think that it's important to have like this kind of alternative topics in these kind of conferences because it opens uh, uh, a way of talking and thinking about these tools that is not in these parallel lines. And I think that that's important. If we want to, to like, uh, convoke a more diverse audience, we need this kind of messiness. So yeah, I deliver. I was m messy, and I think that that was like the kind of the idea. But today we're going to address like, more concrete examples um, that, that deals with this kind of, of uh, embodied practices and, uh, yeah, the particular points. So um, the question was related with how we can change the tools that change us. As I told you yesterday, the core idea is to introduce self-referential digital tools. The idea is, is that a tool that is digital can describe itself in two ways in the documentation. It can embed the documentation inside, but it's kind of a poor way of doing it. And the second one is by creating this continuum between the tool and the source code. So what I did was to create a tool to write, essentially because I believe, as, uh, as um, Gilad said, that, that writing is some kind of, let's say, universal interface for those uh, of us that were uh, enculturated in the printing press culture. Um, so the idea was to, to use this, this tool to, let's say, create a bridge between the Unix tradition and the small tool one. So in Unix you have the everything is a file mantra, and in small tool you have the everything is an object mantra. And the idea was to combine those uh, two mantras to have like a tool that allows you to write, uh, but the writing that you are doing is by mixing objects. That's the idea. And, and my idea was to have two kind of objects. Uh, object that is uh, related with prose, uh, like 
I don't know, common pros, the, the one that you use uh, all the time to communicate to each other, and the other one that was related with coding. So if we have like this kind of tool, we can mix uh, to create data stories. That was like the idea. Um, and for that, I used it, uh, like a lot of prototypes. The prototypes were uh, particularly with two kind of prototypes. The first one were, were events. We have like these uh, workshops and hackathons. We are like com complete, completing like 700 hours since 2015. And they have like a, a two format, uh, uh, yeah, like time slot. The first one was called the data week that has this anti-hackathon roots. As, as I told you yesterday, the problem with the hackathon is that it's becoming this kind of exploitation festival for young people. Like you invite some, peop some young people to deliver uh, a prototype because you like the technology and all that stuff. And if you uh, want the competence, you are going to, I don't know, win a Nintendo or something like that. You only need to be like sleep deprived and, and create value for a company. Like that, that, that was not the idea of the original hackathon. But yeah, the hackathon ethos became gentrified. So we created this kind of anti-hackathons trying to go back to the roots. It was this kind of bridge between the past and the future of a community in this kind of celebratory sense. And it was mediated by prototyping. We are doing uh, like prototypes all the time. And we created like a shorter version that was, that was, was called the Data Rodas that was also like a joke on the coding dojo. Like, like this idea that you go to a dojo to do this kind of abstract uh, exercises about, I don't know, calculating prime numbers or something like that, instead of this uh, informatics that is more re related with the day-to-day -day practices of the everyday. Um, yeah, so we did uh, a lot of this, and the next one will be next uh, Tuesday. And we started to do both programming, even before it was trendy, because the idea was that, um, that we want to, let me try this. The idea was that we want to create um, like um, like um, just let me yeah the idea was that we were to create like this uh, place where different people can talk about code but not by writing code so uh, some people that know how to write code talk with other people had who doesn't and we start to talk about like this collective way of approaching problems uh, and they they came from philosophy and journalists and music and art and design and they start to, to suggest the problem or the solution and to pass from the what to the how. This, this kind of algorithmic thinking and modularization. Um, uh, so uh, yeah, and we did uh, like a small short intensive course. The issue is that when you have infrastructure, infrastructure has a lot of properties Susan Lake Star, that is a theoretician that, that works with, um, with infrastructure, she says that infrastructure has like several uh, like properties, but it has two. The first one is that it's relational. So something that is infrastructure for someone can, cannot be for someone else. So the chairs are infrastructure for us. We use that for putting our yeah, bodies. Um, but also, but it, it is not for a carpenter. For a carpenter, the, the chair is the topic, it's not infrastructure. And, um, and the other thing is that it's invisible until it fails. So nobody knows uh, where is the router or what is the password until internet fails. So the idea that we have this infrastructure that is invisible until, until it fails. And also I told that, that infrastructure has a lot of other properties. The first one is that it organized, organizes and accumulates actions. So we are now here because we have this infrastructure and probably the next people who is going to meet uh, uh, in this university is going to use this infrastructure for, for keeping with these kind of meetings. And it also embeds and transport context. So when you, for example, use JIT, you are, uh, well, or, well, I don't use JIT a lot, but anyway. So we are like, like um, embedding the context of the people who design JIT in a way. So this idea of the eternal pull request and all that stuff, is because the bureaucracy of the Linux kernel requires that kind of development. But that doesn't translate to every developer community in the world. In fact, the, the developers of Fossil don't use not Git and not uh, this push-pull uh, uh, 
bureaucracy because they don't require that. This is a small community where people trust each, uh, trust each other. So yeah, infrastructure has a lot of logics behind. And when we adopt the infrastructure, we adopt the, the logistics. So that, that's what I think that about the, this idea of it's just a web link. Is yeah, just a web link requires all the internet behind. So when we have like these uh, ideas about infrastructure, we are uh, t taking with us the invisible assumptions in, in those infrastructure. And also infrastructure informs uh, imagination. What we can imagine depends on the materialities that we use to imagine that by, by affirmation or by resistance. Like we don't, I, don't, I want something that is like this, but, or I don't want something that is like that. So it's informing all the time imagination. Imagination is, is material in a way. It's materially informed. So um, the idea is that if we deploy alternative infrastructures, we can accumulate actions pointing to alternative futures. By deploying alternative infrastructural stacks, we can like, create these kind of alternative futures. And we can use places in the global south to explore those alternative futures. So I coined a term that is, I, I call it pocket infrastructures. So the idea of a pocket infrastructure is that it's simple, self-contained, extensible, works in a variety of uh, software, and is local first. Um, yeah, and that's because when we use some kind of metaphor for infrastructure, we also accept the implicit ideas behind uh, th that metaphor. So for example, the idea of the cloud is like, when, when you ask the people what is the cloud, no, nobody knows. Like, I mean, in the, in the general public, it's like this kind of fluffy, uh, ubiquitous, ubiquitous place. But, but uh, some, uh, like, I don't know, hacker sticker says that the cloud is others' computers. So when you are putting something into the cloud, you are putting something in uh, places that are the computers of others. And those places are usually for this uh, extractivist panoptic economy. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's to be like a spite. So we need another kind of uh, names uh, for another kind of metaphors. So what we did was a lot of, um, lot of uh, prototypes in several domains. So I will talk about those domains, but I need water like always. So I don't know, let me just. Okay, so um, So these are the prototypes that we build with these kind of infrastructures. Um, so the first one was the Graphoscopio manual. So Graphoscopio is this tool I made for my PhD. It's uh, like an outliner. So it's, uh, the idea is that you can like, mix interactive documentation with data storytelling, with data activists, with reproducible research and publishing. And it has uh, like, a lot of points of, of inspiration. As I told you, it was my first uh, FADO program ever. And you can tell by the code quality. But uh, it has inspirations from TechMax. TechMax is like this scientific editor that is interactive. So you can put like mathematics and uh, graphics and uh, equations and calculate them and visualize them inside TechMax. It has also the Leo editor that is like this outlining. You can like, like create hierarchies and sequences of ideas that are nested. Um, uh, also Jupyter Notebook. So at, the, at that moment it, it was called IPython Notebook. With the idea is that you have like this interactive place for writing, and of course, a small tool because I want I want to have like this kind of continuum that is traversable, that like you can go from one place to another to another, um, and I want to have like an application that is by default there, but that application helps you to understand the environment and to deconstruct that environment and to extend that environment. So, an application to tell that stories. So it was not for everybody. It was not some kind of universal user. It was an adult that was in the Global South, in Bogota, and was interested to tell stories with data. Uh, it can be yeah, a philosopher, a designer, an artist, uh, an activist. Uh, yeah, that kind of people. Um, and yeah, I, I like to have like this continuum uh, with a nice uh, language behind. Um, so this is like the interface. As I told you yesterday, uh, yeah, you cannot see like really well over here. but. The idea that you have like this outlining, like over here. So it's like a tree-like document with these kind of notes that are Mardown or Faro. And the outliner is like uh, readable by the same outliner. So you can use a note to declare how the complete outliner is going to be processed. 
So if you need, like, I don't know, flags to export to some format, you can put that inside the document. So the document is self-contained and also talks about how the document is exported to several formats. Um, so, yeah, for example, well, the, the color and the resolution do doesn't help, but there is a lot of, of uh, information over here uh, about how, do you, how you can use Pandoc, uh, an external tool, to export this document as a PDF. And when you use the document to, to read the information about how you can export the document inside itself, you can get the Graphoscopio manual that is written in Graphoscopio and exported from Graphoscopio using external tools with these notes that talk about these externalities. Um, yeah. And uh, um, the second uh, document that we did was uh, the Data Feminist Book uh, Republishing. So the idea was that Catherine Dignacio and Laurie Klein, they, they were asking for comments about uh, their book. Um, but yeah, it was at, at the end of the year, and in Colombia nobody works uh, th at that moment. We are like, I don't know, like eating like natillas and stuff like that. So yeah, it was not the best moment for asking for feedback. Uh, nobody is going to, to, uh, to give them feedback in December. Right? I don't know what happened with those people over there. But anyway, the issue was that we don't have the proper time for that. So we, we make a meta comment, not about the content of the book, but about the infrastructure that supports the publication of the book. So what we did was, um, ah, yeah, what, what's the idea of the book? Because this is also related with what we're doing over here, over, over there. So the idea is that you can use intersectional feminists to deconstruct other kind of power relationships that are beyond gender. So user, developer, or data user, data consumer, or executable versus source code. This idea that you have natural binaries and the power is in one side and not in the other, and that's the natural stuff. You can use the, the same like, theoretical framework of, of the feminists to deconstruct those kind of binaries behind technology. So we make this meta comment, and in this meta comment, we take the, the book and we migrate that from the pop pop uh, MIT publishing place to our pocket infrastructures. So it's kind of the same. I'm going to show you like really quickly. I think that I don't have a lot of time. But anyway, the idea was that that um, that we this uh, is just um, a fossil repository. I'm going to show you really really quick. Um, so this is the same book, but it doesn't have like all the Java, script plus Node.js plus whatever thing is behind is just a fossil repository with, uh, yeah, I think that yeah, is the classical in a demo. So it's not loading. I think that is related with the intranet plus permissions. But anyway, the idea is that you can see like, yeah, it's not going to load like, because we are in demo mode. But the issue is that you have like a, a really small fossil repository with a light format that is called Mardip, and this Mardip format describes everything that is in the book. So we don't need like extra stuff, and you have like a single zip file, and you take all the documentation with you. And it's uh, like a really, really simple infrastructure for publishing or republishing stuff. Uh, and we, yeah, we made that in 2019, and also we did that before with the data journalist book. The idea was, because there is also this idea of what I call the factual freedoms versus the nominal ones. So the nominal freedom is the idea that you have the freedom to do this stuff. And the factual freedom is the, the, the freedom that you can exercise, like for real. So when you create something with creative commons, like for example in, the, in, the, in this manual, the idea is that, um, yeah, let me show you over here. Maybe this is going to work, I don't know. But the idea is that, that you have like these places where, where people publish stuff under Creative Commons licenses. So they are supposedly open, but it's just a PDF. And in the best of, in the best of cases, you have like HTML and that's it. And what we did was to scrap that and to put that in a light format with, with an automatic translation that it was markdown. And also again to use Graphoscopio to describe the way that the book is going to be exported. Uh, so from the, this, this is the, these notes are the, the data journalist book, uh, scrap it, and in Markdown, inside a Graphoscopy notebook. And this note, the, the percentage metadata note, uh, contains the information to create a PDF from this notebook. 
So at the end, we, get, we got something like this. Uh, but this PDF is, uh, is self-contained and is reproducible. You can like download the, the notebook in Graphoscopio and you can execute the notebook and get the PDF back because it knows how to reproduce itself. Um, so it was about like, like making the people to have in the grassroots communities to have the possibilities to exercise voice in a different way by using the open uh, uh, nature of some licensed works to republish those works. So, for example, this is the same book, but with a different prologue. And in, the, in that prologue, we are talking about these other ways of making for real the openness work. Not this kind of, you have this license, but, and also just the PDF. It's like, like no, we need the source code, and we need a proper repository, and we need a, we need a repository with, with low uh, entries, uh, barrier of entries, uh, barrier of entrada. Yeah, I am going to use Spanglish, as I told you, so, yeah. Um, uh, and yeah, we, we create all the time this kind of, so we create a collective document about how to use these uh, tools and techniques to create collective documents. So it was a, a document written in collective about how to read documents in collective. That was the idea, because these techniques are not in any other place. It was like developed in the, inside the hacker space. Again, we write that together and we, we make writing a performative act. So it's not you writing in solitary because you have this kind of enlightenment. It's you writing with partners in real time using a collective uh, Markdown document editor in real time and using that to create the PDF back. So this was the other um, prototype and we did a lot. And w some teachers in the, university of, in the University of Cauca, that is kind of a rural region with a lot of indigenous population over there, create the, uh, a set of uh, videos about how you can use these tools to, to create, let's say, uh, non-institutionalized uh, uh, classroom environment, digital classroom environment. In the sense that, because infrastructure reflects culture, when you use Moodle, you recreate the classroom, the bureaucratic one, the hierarchical. But when you just put a link and create this kind of open documentation that is hyperlinked and agile, you create another kind of learning place. So it was about how you can use these tools to create this kind of decentralized learning environment that is emergent and, and without like bureaucracy behind. We also use um, Graphoscopy for making reproducible research. So the idea behind reproducible research is that you, can, you need to sustain and extend uh, research claims. By, by bridging code, data, prose, and visualization, and it's beyond the PDF. So you can use the PDF as an output format, but the idea is that you have all the resources mixed into a single narrative. Uh, we, we, do, we did that for uh, health-related information, so this was the master thesis of, of, of a friend. She was like asking uh, herself about what is the information that the governments uh, publish about uh, medicine, uh, like the active components behind some medicines. And we create this custom visualization inspired in, the, in, the, in a visualization that was from the, from the I, I, I'm going to show you. Let's hope that this time this works. So yeah, the idea was to create domain specific visualizations. Uh, so we use a uh, uh, visualization from the Guardian that was about like gay rights in the United States and how you can see that these, uh, those gay rights are like located in a geographical fashion. So the states in the south uh, east are not favorable for those kind of populations. Uh, but, but what's a way of, of visualizing absences of rights in this case? And we use that to create uh, absences, so visualization of absences of information for, for the information that she wants to, to showcase in, in her thesis. Uh, and we create this, uh, we, we take a tool and, and start to customize it. So we create a lot of, of these kind of uh, um, prototypes. There is a lot of them. We work with making uh, Panama Papers reproducible. Um, and we participate with this in several events. Uh, yeah, and we create some uh, what we call the data selfies. We participate by creating data narratives for the Citizen Air Quality Network in Bogota that is creating open hardware for measuring the quality of airs in the Transmilenio public uh, transport network. Uh, and we create finally, this was our kind of last project that was called Candidatos and Datos. 
It was like creating a visualization of, um, of the candidates for the last electoral um, election, yeah, in pre presidential election over there. So we create a way of, of, of seeing the discourse, but not by reading each post of, of each candidate, but having like this kind of big overview of, of what is the discourse and, and creating some kind of, this is called graphicacy. So you need to, to know how to read these, these graphics. It's not like everything by themselves, but gives you a way of dealing with complex data in a different way. Uh, of course, with the proper literacy. And it was a way to, to work with this kind of literacy. We don't use, we use data from Twitter, but not the Twitter API, because we didn't want to subscribe those uh, terms. So we use a scrapper, an alternative scrapper. And, and the idea behind of, uh, all, all of these prototypes is that, that um, we are creating this kind of, of data stories. Uh, this is going to be like the last one before conclusions. So this is, for example, something that I am doing with my students that are future uh, librarians and archivists and, uh, and uh, information scientists. So most of them, is going, they're going to work in libraries. And we are like making wikis and creating visualizations of their wiki portfolios. So the idea behind these kind of prototypes is that we use code to, in, to understand like complex issues. And we try to make code a common language. Uh, because when you have like these interdisciplinary approaches, it's mostly like a cadena de montaje or whatever you translate that. Production like line. production line, yeah. So the idea is that you, you put this part, you the mathematician, and you pass that to the sociologist, and the sociologists do that, and pass that to the other and to the other, because we don't have common languages. So the idea is to create these common languages, and these common languages are mediated by code but don't require code as a prerequisite of participation in this collective uh, uh, creation. Uh, we start to create code for them, for the people who is assisting to the events, and, and create, let's say, an um, invitation. So they can uh, learn code by themselves if they want, but not as a prerequisite. And trying to address, let's say, complex issues no, is not the hello world approach to programming. It's more about how code is embedded in social practices and in the understanding of complex issues. Uh, and that's what we are doing in a more concrete fashion, with this kind of how this messiness embodies in, in like particular practices and in particular software. And once some people learn how to create their own uh, data stories, a friend of mine is a musician, uh, and, and he's working on, on this approach. He learned how to program in Faro, and now he's modifying the tools that we are using to create these stories. So he traversed the path from being a musician with the proper sensibility for live coding. In fact, he plays a, a joystick and in, a, in a noise band in Bogota, to being a programmer that is modifying the tools that modify uh, um, his own practices. Uh, the idea is to, to, to create that um, path for more, for more people uh, with these kind of practices. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, go on. <laughs> uh, so, uh, about the uh, custom graphics and this graphicacy. Uh, yeah, graphicacy, yeah, the literacy about graphics, uh, yeah. So, uh, I like the idea. I wonder how, how, how is your experience uh, concerning broad adoption of this custom graph and stuff like that? So, how, how, how to make them more, adopt, uh, more easily adopted? Okay, uh, for me, this idea of narration of the core of the experience of the learning experience for me is, is important because that, like, let's say, bridge the printing culture because you are like writing a document with the computer culture because the, this document is interactive. I don't think that is about like bigger numbers. I think that is about like dense experiences. So, for example, the, the, this tool has a, 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 an associated tool that is called Minidocs. Minidocs is porting these lessons from, uh, from Graphoscopio to Lepiter, the, the Glamorous Toolkit uh, uh, interactive writing tool. And we have like this really clever, I think, uh, format for publishing data narratives. It's not working today because, yeah, it's the demo day. But the idea is that you just have JavaScript 
and, uh, and metadata and, uh, and uh, a light markup language. So we, we have things that, that Jupyter Notebook don't have or Ormo don't have or the more established uh, like publishing data narratives platforms they, they don't have. And we have that because we are working with a pretty moldable tool like, like Faro and the Glamorous Toolkit. Uh, and we are not caring about like following others' hist history or getting big numbers. It's more about like having these like really dense uh, agile experiences with the small communities that are willing to stay for the long run. Uh, so for me, it's, it's more about that. So I, I don't know if that ans answered your question. I don't know. Uh, my question, if you want more direct, how do I put the custom graph into a paper, into a, a scientific paper, and get it accepted? Okay. Okay. Yeah. No. And I don't like papers. <laughs> I think that papers are like a, a, a course of the academy. So I, I don't know. I don't know. Mm, you can do other stuff. The, the last, the last, uh, so uh, really, really quick. But the last, the last thing that we, that we are doing, uh, let me show you. This, this example, this living books example, let me show you. So this is the porting of the, this is a data narrative behind, uh, oh, I don't know if it's going to work, but anyway, no, yeah, it's not. But what we did was to take, uh, there is an, uh, an academician, she's called Janeke Adema, and she criticizes papers and the, and the, let's say, death of the book as a primary format for expressing thought in academia. Uh, and I think that we need to be part of that resistance. We need to, to think in, in living books, in books that are like open and are like, like uh, a way of expressing more uh, different thoughts that are not formatted by the paper. So I understand your concern, it's, it's not mine. And I think that I'm going to be part of the resistance because there is a lot of people already thinking in paper. So, yeah. Oh, there's no more time. Okay. Now I just have it for. Uh, regarding your uh, emphasis in that uh, you don't like papers, but maybe uh, we can change uh, his question. How can you integrate this with LaTeX? Because. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. Yeah. What, what we did is we take this light format that is like Marlon and Mardip. We export that into LaTeX and we use custom filters to create custom proce processors. So, for example, yeah, no next, no, no, none of the examples is loading now. But for example, for the for the documentaton book, I will try to show you. I don't know. But, but for the documentaton book, what we did was to use Lua filters. To, to process, oh yeah, this is working. So uh, what we did was to process Lua filters to create this uh, exported LaTeX that was enriched uh, with a custom way of, of enrichment. So it was uh, writing in a light format using uh, Graphoscopio, in, in fact, and uh, uh, using after that Lua because it was embedded in Pandoc, but now we can use uh, Marlib or, or even Faro to create this kind of, let's say, uh, yeah, this kind of, of uh, like typographic, um, typographic, uh, yeah, like additions. Uh, we can use that for, I don't know, taking pictures or processing stuff or adding equations. So you are writing in this light format that is Markdown or Markdip. You are using an interactive editor for that. And when you need to process that into LaTeX, what you do is that you use like custom filters to extend the, the syntax. Yeah. 